Okay, Dave, go ahead and introduce yourself, please. Well, thank you very much for having me. My name is Dave Hussman. I'm in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, and I'll share my screen here. And uh, today we'll be talking about uh, operating with one and two move waybills and talk about car forwarding on my Wilmington Northern Railroad. Uh, what we're going to be talking about <clears throat> is uh, uh, a little overview of car cards and waybills, an overview of the Wilmington and Northern uh, that I model, and then why my waybills will probably look different than your waybills. Uh, we'll talk about uh, blocking as a tool for car forwarding and the power of blocking. I'll go through the different types and functions of my waybills. And then we'll go through how I restage between session because that's where the magic happens. Uh, the focus of this is gonna be on the owner or the person setting up an operating session rather than an operator. The operators really don't care how many uh, moves you have on your way bills. They're just interested in whatever the one is that's active at the time. And this is gonna probably seem complicated in a lot of places for, uh, for people, but that's because you're not a subject matter expert on my layout. However, you are the subject matter expert on your layout. You know where all the cars are, you know where all the industries are, you know what they ship, you know what they receive, you know how all your trains are routed, uh, you've set up all the billing yourself, so you are the subject matter expert, and anything that uh, anybody wants to know about your railroad you know it. So any kind of decision you have to make on your layout is not going to be uh, complicated. Car cards and waybills is a uh, model railroad system that uh, replicates a prototype waybill. Um, in order to recycle and reuse the different uh, pieces so we didn't have to keep writing everything down, it was split into two parts a car card that carries the car information and a way bill that carries the shipment information. And just because of the shape and form of the way bill, uh, they evolved into a uh, four move way bill was a standard. So on each little way bill card, you've got a top and a bottom, a front and a back. So four positions. So that was what people used. And generally it works out to either uh, two pairs of either empty load or load empty type shipments. And that works uh, for most people that works well. Uh, but just remember that a four move way bill is uh, an option and it may be a standard, but it is not required. You can do whatever you want uh, with the way bills. That's the beauty of the car card and way bill system is that you can modify it uh, to whatever suits your railroad and your operation. And I took that liberty. The railroad I uh, am modeling, the Wilmington and Northern Railroad, was built in the 1870s between Wilmington, Delaware, and Reading, Pennsylvania, uh, about 70 miles or so. Uh, you can see Philadelphia is over here on the uh, right edge, and then between Reading and Wilmington, Delaware. In 1895, it was leased by the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad. Uh, railway, which is eventually became called the, the Reading Company, and that's how most people know about it. Uh, if you play Monopoly, you've seen it. Uh, it was uh, bought by the PNR around 1900, although it kind of remained as a separate thing. It was still listed as the Wilmington and Northern Railroad in the timetable up until the uh, um, like the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, there are a lot of interchanges on it. It interchanges with the B&O down at Wilmington. And then it has five interchanges with the Pensy. Uh, I managed to get uh, four of the five in there. I didn't get Chad's board and I'm sad about that, but uh, I did get four of them in there. Now, after the purchase, the junction between the, the P&R and the Wilmington and Northern was moved from Reading up here down to Birdsboro. So all of the Wilmington and Northern trains, freight trains terminated at Birdsboro and then their cars were picked up by uh, PNR through freights. And conversely, the PNR through freights would set out cars 
at the junction uh, for the Wilmington and Northern. The portion of the Wilmington and Northern between Birdsboro and Reading was extended around the city of Reading and became known as the Beltline, uh, used as a bypass around Reading and the Norfolk Southern still uses that uh, railroad for that purpose to this day. My layout is set in October of 1903. So we're right after the merger, we're right after the, all the changes to the operating plan have taken place. You will notice that my car cards and way bills look different. And that's because I'm modeling a, a different form than most people are using. Uh, since I'm in 1903, the way bill hadn't been invented yet. The way bill as we know it, that, that everybody, uh, probably most people are using, um, or I've seen. But in my research, I came across something called a car ticket. It's actually mentioned in the rules. And the formal name of it is a memorandum way bill. And they were used in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, the conductors would carry one for each car. And it was a handwritten form that had the information about the, uh, the car on it. They were different sizes. I've got examples that are about half again as big as a typical car card and way bill all the way up to about a half a, a sheet of paper. If you, the thing that struck me when I saw these was that how closely they resemble a model railroad car card and way bill. It's got basically the, exactly the same information on it in pretty close to the same order that we use. Um, the interesting thing is that the empty, there's a, a form for the empty uh, cars and that form actually survived as an empty car waybill uh, up until the end of waybills, um, paper waybills on real railroads. So you can go on eBay and find empty uh, car waybills, and it's basically the evolution of the system. So here's some examples of some uh, prototype uh, car tickets. They range from 1886 up to 1899. Uh, the one on the left uh, is just a little, about half again as big, maybe six inches by three inches. Um, so it's not that much bigger than a regular car card and way bill. And if you'll notice, it's got this, all the, they all have about the same information as a model railroad car card and way bill. It's got the car number from to a via line, the uh, shipper and consignee, um, a routing, it's got the lading information. So it's it's got all the same information that we use on a car card and way bill. So it just seemed to be the perfect thing to model. Now on my layout operation, uh, I had been using regular four move way bills, but I was becoming dissatisfied with them because I didn't have control over my the local work. I could never figure out you know, get the, the, some days the local would have two or three cars uh, or a switch engine would have two or three cars to a spot at industry. Sometimes they'd have 30. Um, it was hard to maintain the blocking. I was getting routings that to me seemed inappropriate for the car. So I just decided that I did not like the four move way bills. They were too hard for me to manage. And I started grad, uh, gradually going towards a two-move waybill system. And when I hit the car tickets, I realized the format of this just lent itself perfectly to two-move waybills. And so I, I went in that direction. And I now have two waybill types. I have the two-move waybills, which are my normal revenue moves. And I have a one-move waybill, which, which is for my uh, special situations and, and uh, routing, extra routing and that, and any other thing I, I need them for. Uh, one thing I will mention on my layout is that with all the interchanges I have, and since my connection to the uh, PNR is a junction yard, I consider the junctions and interchanges as staging tracks. Some people consider them industries or whatever, but I consider them as staging tracks. So whenever I talk about staging, I'll be talking about the interchanges or the junction yard. So that's uh, there at Birdsboro. So that's the, the equivalency. A critical thing that you have to take in mind is that 
all of the stuff we're talking about is not limited to somebody using car tickets and it's not limited to somebody modeling 1900. Everything we're talking about can be used in any era by virtually any car card and way bill system. So uh, don't think it's only for somebody modeling the turn of the century with some uh, you know, obsolete system. It is, um, it is applicable, the, the concepts are applicable even to this day. One of the concepts that I found that is, is really important uh, in railroading from my own personal experience uh, working on a prototype is blocking. Blocking is the fundamental method that real railroads use to manage their car flows. When a real railroad describes what kind of cars are on a train, how many cars are on a train, what switching they have to do, they're talking about blocking. A train carries uh, these blocks and you have a block, you know, a block of 20 Little Rocks or 20 North Platts. They talk of blocking is the, the unit of organization that's used for car movement. And I just uh, define blocking as a group of cars that will be handled together to the next location they are processed. And that could be a yard where they're gonna be classified. It could be an interchange where they're given to another railroad, a connection where they go to a different route on the same railroad or a different subdivision or something like that. It could be a station where something's going to happen to them. It could be an industry where they're going to be set out as a block, but it's these cars are going to be handled as a group and the individual cars are a member of that group. Real railroad cars also have three destinations. There's the final destination, that's where the car is ultimately going. There's a system destination, that's where the car is going on that railroad. And then there's the next destination. That's the next place that the railroad's gonna take the car to do something to it. That is typically the block, the name of the block and what the block is on a railroad. Cars will ride in many different blocks as it travels across a railroad. So here's an, a modern day example. Uh, let's say we have a car in Los Angeles on the UP and it's going via Memphis to a customer in Chattanooga, Tennessee via the CSX. So the final destination of the car is Chattanooga. For the UP, the system destination is Memphis because that's as far as they're gonna take it on the, um, on the uh, UP. And then the next destination of the car is actually North Platte because that's the next place the car is going to get switched. So if you ask the yard master at Los Angeles what kind of cars he has in the yard, he'll tell you, I have 100 North Platts. Now, I can pretty much guarantee that not a single one of those cars is actually going to North Platte. They're all going to places east of North Platte. But as far as the railroad is concerned, they're North Platte cars because they're all going to get switched at North Platte. If you ask the train crew what's on your train, they're going to say 100 North Platts. If you ask the dispatcher what's on the train, he's going to say 100 North Platts. They consider it a North Platte train because that's the block. When it gets to North Platte, they'll be switched and they'll pick up a new block and it'll be Little Rock. And that's because that's the next place the car will be switched in its journey. So once again, if you ask the yard master at North Platte what he's got in his train, he's going to say, Little Rocks. I've got a hundred Little Rocks for the train and everybody will consider that car a Little Rock even though it's not going to Little Rock. And as a matter of fact, most of the cars in the Little Rock block aren't gonna be going to Little Rock. And then when it gets to Little Rock, the next destination will change to Memphis because they're gonna build a block at Memphis or excuse me, at Little Rock to go to Memphis to give to the CSXT. Now, no point have they anybody ever actually said anything about Chattanooga? Because as far as the UP is concerned, they're only taking it, the system destination is Memphis. So they're only taking it as far as Memphis. Once it gets delivered to the CSX at Memphis, 
This whole thing process starts over again. And then the CSX, their system destination is the same as the final destination. And they'll have their blocks that'll drive it towards Chattanooga. The, on the car tickets, I ended up using the v, first VIA line for my blocking information. And I put my block name in there. And then to help the uh, operators, since they aren't as familiar with things and to, as a quicker recognition, I color coded it. And I also added a few little sub blocks uh, for the yard at Wilmington, because it's got several distinct switching areas. And so that helps the yard crews know and the industry jobs know where the car goes in that particular terminal. So here's on the left, that's my uh, block code poster. Got it hanging up on the wall. You, when you, you may actually be able to see it when I uh, turn the, uh, the PowerPoint off, but um, it's got each of the colors and each of the, uh, the different blocks that I have. Uh, the green stripe up at the top, is uh, all um, what I call the reading block. And that's all the connections that go back to the PNR. Anything that goes to Birdsboro proper is pink. Uh, the steel mills at Coatesville get a nice rusty orange. Uh, the B&O is a blue color. And then Wilmington are all the uh, yellow colors. And I've got the six little um, sub blocks for each of the different switching areas. The Delaware River Extension, Maryland Avenue, H&H, uh, &H, the float, uh, car float, 6th Avenue, and then the Kentmere branch. And then on the uh, right side are some examples of my car cards and waybills. And you can see where I've got on each one of them, I've got on the VIA line, I've got the block name and the corresponding color. And so that is very recognizable. And you can see instantly what block and um, that those cars are going to be riding in. Then each of the yard masters has a blocking sheet. And I have a little uh, a picture there of each of the trains, types of trains that they're going to build, and what the blocking, the block names, and the block colors that are going to be in them. So the yard masters can look at that and see what block should be on each train they're going to make what direction it's going and how they should be ordered. Uh, for my train crews, um, for a, I guess what you would call a train card, I use what I call an agent message since an agent is the person that tells the train crew uh, what cars are gonna uh, set out and pick up along the way. Uh, they're the business manager. So the, in the uh, agent messages that tell the train crews what to do, I also reference the block names in that. So now the cars are saying what block they're in, the yard masters can build the trains based on the blocks and the train crews have instructions on what to do based on the blocks. So the whole idea of this is to help the operators know how to route and group cars without having to know the geography of the layout. What I wanna do is eliminate the what do I do with this car questions so that the the, my operators can just concentrate on switching and concentrating on moves, and we don't have to have a, a pop geography quiz in the middle of an operating session. The, the blocking takes care of all that and simplifies all that for them. So my waybills. My two move waybills are all my normal movement waybills, and I've got two different types of those. Uh, the origin load, uh, that's a load where the car is going to be loaded at an industry on my layout. The first move is an empty car order for an empty going to the online industry. And the second move after it's loaded is a outbound move of a loaded car to another industry, to an interchange, a junction, something like that away from the industry. The other type is the inbound load. On an inbound load, the car is loaded somewhere off of my layout and comes onto my layout through one of the interchanges or junction as a load, goes to an online industry, it is emptied, and then uh, the move two is the empty return move, usually a reverse route. 
So here's some examples of those. On the left is the origin load. The first move is an empty boxcar to the superphosphate plant in uh, the Sixth Avenue area in Wilmington. And it gets loaded. It's got a load of fertilizer going back to Albany, New York. Well, how do you get to Albany, New York from Wilmington, Delaware? Don't know, don't care, because it's a Redding car. It's got in the Redding block. So the yard engine is going to take it, or the switch engine is going to bring it back to the yard. The yard is going to say it's a Redding, and they know that a Redding car goes in a north uh, through freight. So they will put it on a north through freight and send it out. When it gets to Birdsboro, the crew at switch crew at Birdsboro knows the Redding cars go into the belt yard. And so they will switch it out and put it into the belt yard. Nobody had to know how to get from Wilmington to Albany. Same thing with the inbound load. We've got an inbound load uh, of lumber going to the Delaware River Extension, the Marine Terminal, and it'll get unloaded and then it becomes an empty car going back to Reading. On my one move waybills, that's the two move waybills. They're, they're pretty simple. The one move waybills, I use those to balance the traffic and um, and the flows to and from staging to handle excess cars and to do some uh, uh, internal actions that I uh, for the layout. So this is the um, the first type of one move way bill. It's an overhead loaded move, and they are uh, to or from interchange. And this I use these to balance the traffic flows. They have no specific origin or destination, no specific lading or, uh, or shipper or consignee. Uh, they just say that it's got a generic load of freight in it. So I can use it in any car. I can use it from uh, basically any on point to another off point. These are for cars that are just gonna travel across the layout. I used to have waybills that had specific cars and had specific car types. And get closer to it. Uh, this is my overhead loaded move. Uh, they are for cars that are traveling across the layout with uh, that do not stop at an online industry. Uh, they just go right on across from someplace to someplace and overhead. Uh, they have no specific origin. No specific destination, no specific shipper, no specific uh, consignee, and they say they're the car is loaded with something, uh, but they don't say what the specific commodity is, and they're not assigned to any car type. So I can use these on any type of car going across the layout. I used to have car uh, waybills that were specifically designed uh, for a, a specific shipment on a route and uh, to a specific type of car with a commodity, but managing all those was uh, a lot of work. And really the only thing that, that is important on this is the blocking line, because with the blocking line, I can route the car all the way across. Um, and that's the only piece of information that the crews really need to know to uh, accomplish the task. The similar car is the empty return. And that's basically the same kind of concept, except it's an empty car instead of a load. And once again, there's no specific information other than the blocking uh, line that drives it to whatever interchange or uh, exit point from my layout. I have a specific type of empty car move called, an, I call an agent hold. And I have a, uh, uh, a lot of iron and steel industry on my layout. Um, and so I need a lot of empty gondolas. So I use these empty car waybills, uh, agent holds, to drive empty gons to the yards where I have the, uh, the steel mills and foundries and to hold them for future billing. So I build up a, uh, a collection of gons there and then the agent will bill out the gons as needed and the switch crew will spot the gons as needed at the various uh, iron industries. So I put those on empty system gons, 
connecting road guns like B&Os and uh, Pensies, and then any kind of empty gun that becomes empty at a uh, mill itself. And these are uh, used to accumulate cars for loading. And then there are the action way bills. The action way bills are uh, drive a car to a location to do something specific to it. Now, full disclosure, the only ones I'm using right now are cleaning. I haven't set up any kind of the, the scale tracks yet. And the Wilmington and Northern had no icing facilities whatsoever. So I will probably never use an icing car, but if you, uh, uh, a lot of model railroads, if you're modeling Southern California, you'll be all over icing. Um, the way I use these is I can either, um, for the example, a New York Central car, I can either put them in the pocket just by themselves. It drives it to, this would drive the car to Coatesville to the cleaning track. Once it's cleaned, I would pull the waybill and then have to put another waybill in on top of it. Or I can put some other type of waybill in the pocket. For example, I've got an agent hold waybill on the PRR car, and I just put the, uh, the cleaning track car on top of it, and then that drives it to the cleaning track at Coatesville. They clean the gun, they pull the um, cleaning track waybill, and then it just becomes another agent hold. So the beauty of these type of action waybills are that you can increase the amount of activity, the amount of switching on your layout, but you don't have to increase the number of cars because it can drive the cars between internally between a lot of little de destinations on your layout and do a lot of different activities without having to increase the car count, which is great if you've got a small layout. And lastly, uh, I have what I call a spot tag. Uh, the spot tag uh, arose because I was having um, uh, issues with uh, my yards serve a lot of industries. And so the, at the beginning of the session, I would have uh, cars for the industry jobs to spot at the yards. They would get the cars, they would go out and work the various industries. But because it's a yard, you're gonna have a constant flow of inbound cars. So the inbound cars would come in and would be switched up and the yard job would come back and see, oh, there's more cars for industries. So they would take those cars and they'd go out and spot them. And some industries might get spotted two, three times a, a session. At the end of the session, I ended up with way too many cars at the industries. And I ended up with no cars in the yard for the next session to spot. So I needed a way to control that. So I invented the spot tag. And what that is, is the uh, switch engine only spots cars that have the spot tag in it. The idea is that the agent has talked to the industries, local industries, found out what they need, found out what cars are in the yard and has either marked the cars or else has drawn up a switch list that says, these are the cars you need to spot today. And so that's what has the spot tag on it. If it doesn't have a spot tag, you leave it in the, uh, um, the yard. The power of this is that you can control how many cars, therefore how much work a switch engine has uh, to do during a shift. So you can regulate how busy a switch engine is, whether you want him something that he's gonna do the entire session or just the first half of the session. You can control that using these spot tags. So, um, we've talked about the waybills, we've talked about the blocking. Um, how do we actually use all this stuff? Well, restaging is where the magic happens. It's where any car forwarding system, that's really where the mechanics of it come into play. So I'm going to assume that all of the trains that I was supposed to operate in the previous session have operated and all the cars are where they're supposed to be to begin the restaging process on my layout. Now, this process actually has evolved over the years. It has actually become simpler. I've eliminated a lot of steps. It may not seem that way, but I have. Um, I mean, I tried a lot of different tacks on it to try and get it to uh, uh, what works for me. The first thing I do is I go around and I pull all the waybills from the cars and interchange and staging. Um, this is a picture of 
the Birdsboro Belt Yard, which is the um, junction between the Wilmington and Northern and the uh, Philadelphia and Reading. At the beginning of the session, all the cars in this yard were cars coming to the Wilmington and Northern. And then at the end of the session, these are all the cars going back to the PNR that'll be picked up by PNR trains, theoretically. So I'll go through there and I will pull all the waybills out of those car cards. Now, if you'll notice on the uh, car cards in the rack, all the waybills have a green stripe. The green stripe is redding. So that means that all of those cars are going off of the Wilmington and Northern back to the, to the redding. So that's good. The caveat to this is if you do have a movement that is dedicated between a uh, staging yard and an industry, for example, if I had a paper mill and I had a dedicated pulpwood train that all it did every session was run from staging to the mill and back, I wouldn't pull those waybills, I'd just turn them. But I don't have any of that currently on my layout, so all of the uh, waybills are fair game and I'll go around and pull all of those waybills. The next thing I do is I turn all the waybills at industry and some of them I will, I will pull. So here we are at, um, at uh, Wilmington and I will decide how many waybills I want to, um, uh, to turn indicating that they need to be pulled on the next session. The obviously the number of waybills that I turn indicates how busy the switch engine will be. Um, I, all the cars that were spotted the last session will have the spot tag in them. So I know which cars have been spotted last session and which cars are left over from a previous session. So normally the previous session cars definitely get pulled and some of the cars that were spotted the uh, or excuse me, all the cars in the sessions before the last session will get uh, turned and the cars, some of the cars that were spotted last session will get turned, the waybills will get turned. So here we've got the uh, Chicago and Alton box car that was spotted at the freight house. It came in as a load of LCL. It's been reload, I turned the waybill in on it and it is been reloaded back out with another load of LCL for Coatesville. That's good, great. The PNR box car had originally come in from the B&O with a load of something for the team track. It was spotted, unloaded. I turned the waybill, and it's got a reverse route back to the B&O. Unfortunately, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because the PNR is not going to give one of its own box cars empty back to the B&O. That's just not something the railroad would do. So I will pull that waybill and replace it on the right side, I'll replace it with an empty car and the uh, default uh, distribution point uh, for my railroad is to send things back to Reading to the PNR for them to distribute. So I'll beam it back to the mothership with a, uh, a Reading empty car waybill. So now I have both of those cars uh, billed properly with waybills that make sense. When I'm, I'll move around to each of the different uh, uh, industrial areas and look at all the way bills and turn some and um, not turn others. But here we're at uh, Coatesville and I had two guns that came in, one load of pig iron and a load of scrap. They've now been unloaded. It, when I turn the way bills, the uh, PNR car is gonna go back to Reading, which is the normal distribution point, And the Pensy car is gonna go back to the PRR interchange. Well, I'm at Coatesville. I need empty gondolas at Coatesville to load steel products outbound. So I'm gonna grab those cars and hold them at Coatesville for future loading. So what I've done is I've put in a um, agent hold way bill into the pocket for each of them. And then I've, since they were both loaded, I've put in a cleaning way bill in front of that. So now those cars are going to go to the cleaning track and then they're going to hold at Coatesville for future loading. So I'll go the, do that and work my way around and uh, adjust all the different uh, waybills of industry. 
Now, no job is finished till the paperwork is done. So it's now time to file the waybills. You can do that at another point in the, the, uh, the uh, process, but I like to do it here. So here's my waybill uh, storage boxes, my yard office. Uh, the box in the center and on the right, or excuse me, on the left, uh, are all my normal movement waybills. I file them by station and then by industry or kind of group of industries, um, if it's a small station, um, for each of the, the different uh, areas. And um, I'll take my waybills that I've collected and I've gathered them all up in my little Athern uh, 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 kit box and I'll sort them out by their uh, move one, where they're going and file them in all the little uh, spots. And then I've also got all my spot tags that I've pulled out along the way. The box on the right are all my um, one move waybills. And that's all my empty returns and my overhead cars and that. I put all my one move waybills in a separate box so that as I go around the layout in these various steps and I need to replace a waybill, I can just carry the box of one move waybills with me and as I need something, just reach and grab it and, and bill it uh, right then, right there. So that saves a lot of time to be able to carry those waybills around with me. So I've gone through and I filed all the waybills and put them all back in the right spot. The next step is to select the waybills for the next session. So I go through and I select all my waybills. Now, the uh, matrix over on the left-hand side, um, is a matrix that I developed for um, you know, a previous iteration of this. And what I was doing then was in order to make sure that I, I pulled the, the number of waybills I needed to support what cars were in the staging yards is I would track how many cars of each type I had in each staging yard. And then I would pull waybills to match that total. Um, I, after doing that for a year or so, I figured out that I really didn't need to do that, that I had just made a pass all the way around at each staging yard, and I had made a pass all around the layout at each industry. So I had a pretty decent idea of what cars I had at the, uh, the interchanges, and I had a pretty decent idea of how heavy the industries were because I had just visited all those car carts. So I stopped uh, doing all that accounting. And right now, all I'm using are these two columns right here. And what I do is for each of the uh, stations and for each industry or group of industries, I pick a certain number of waybills. And I pick a number of waybills that will support the level of, of activity that I want for the switch engine. So for the uh, Wilmington industry job, I'm gonna want somewhere in the 20 to 24 waybills, 20, he, him to spot 20 to 24 cars per session. So I'm gonna pull somewhere around 20 to 24 waybills for the Wilmington industry job. And I'm gonna split them up this way. Now, if you are the type that, that really like to um, uh, have it, tell you is you could build a spreadsheet that had um, the um, uh, some random number generators and some uh, things like that to uh, recommend a specific number of waybills for uh, each area or even each industry, uh, even by car type. You could get it as detailed as you wanted to. I just like to pull them uh, for what I feel is uh, appropriate for the job. It's quicker and easier that way for me. And so I will go through and I will pull uh, all the waybills that I am going to be putting in cars for the next session. Once I get that stack of waybills, I sort them by origin waybills. Those are the waybills that start out as an empty. And by inbound loads, those are the ones that start out as a load and come through an interchange or a junction. And then I sort the inbounds by which interchange or junction they come through. And 
separate all of those out. The ones, the, the way bills on the, um, um, the right there show three different uh, way bills, all for coal, all going to the Lukens plant at Coatesville. And, and they come from different, they all come from different origins. So they would be separated out into a different uh, interchange origin pile. Uh, the one from St. Clair, from Reading, the middle one would come through the Coatesville PRR, and the one on the right would come through uh, the B&O. Now, you may say, well, how can you tell that? They all look the same to me. Well, if, since I wrote them, I know where the routing is, and I can tell, I know where St. Clair is, I know where Butler is, I know where Grafton is. It also has it down here on the VIA line, uh, what the routing is. Plus, if I really wanna cheat, I just turn the card over on the back and the reverse route will tell me what interchange it comes through. So I separate them all out. And then it's now time to go apply the waybills to the cars at, at, uh, in my interchange. So I apply my normal movement waybills. So I will take all my car, my car cards for, the, for each of the tracks and I will look through my, go through my inbound waybills for that interchange first. So I'm at uh, the belt yard in um, Birdsboro. I'm looking through all the Reading cars and I have um, matching up my inbound uh, waybills to the cars. I have a, a waybill for a, a box car of wheat and it's routed over the New York Central and I happen to have a big four box car in one of the tracks. Well, big four is part of the New York Central. That makes a pretty good fit for that. So I'll build that car with the wheat. And I've got a, a load of uh, meat for Swift Meats in, in Wilmington. And I happen to have a Swift Refrigerator Lines car in that, uh, that track. So that's a bingo. That's a perfect match for that. And so I'll go through and I will put in all my um, inbound uh, way bills for that um, interchange in the various tracks. Then I'll go through and I'll apply some of the uh, origin uh, load way bills. Those are the ones that start out as an empty. So I'll pick some of the cars uh, that are, have not been way billed as loads. I'll pick some of those and say, okay, those are empties going to load. You don't have to do all of them because you can, um, uh, Bill apply some of them to cars at industry. For example, if I needed a, a, a box car uh, to load someplace, uh, we all, everybody on this call knows I have an empty box car at uh, Wilmington, so I could build that one if I wanted to. So you've got a lot more flexibility with the origin loads and with the inbounds. Go through and bill all that. The next thing is to apply my one move way bills. So I've gone through and I've applied all the, the way bills that I can in, in Birdsboro, and, but I still have cars left over by design. So here's three cars that I didn't have uh, uh, loaded or loaded way bills or empty car orders for. And there's a empty reefer or there's a reefer, a system gone and a Pensy coal car. So I will then reach into my box of one move way bills and pull out something appropriate for that. So for the MDT car, I will bill that to the B&O as a loaded car going to the loaded move to the B&O as an overhead move. Uh, the uh, PNR empty gone, well, that would be a perfect car to put an agent hold way bill on and send it to Coatesville for loading. And the Pensy coal car, I don't load coal on my layout, so I have really no use for it. So I'm gonna give it back to the, the uh, Pensy at Coatesville because the Coatesville is the east-west main line of the uh, Pensy. And if the car came to me as a loaded load, a load of coal, it probably should go back to them through that junction as a load of coal, as an empty coal car. So I bill all those. I now have all of my cars and all of my tracks billed. If I have extra way bills left over, uh, empty, um, empty car orders, I can go to my industries and apply a few of those. If I end up with uh, too many car way bills left over, I can either 
roll them to uh, the next session, or I can go back and uh, pick a different car or a different industry and swap them out. So I end up now with all of my interchanges are, um, are set up with uh, waybills for all the cars coming in. And lastly, I'm gonna apply spot tags. So I'll go to my each of my yards and I will put spot tags in the cars that are going to industry in that yard. And it might be in a class track, it might be in a track to switch. Occasionally I will put them on an, uh, an interchange track and tell the yard master you need to pull the Pensy interchange before you can spot the steel mill at Coatesville because you've got some spotters in there. And so I'll go through and I will apply the spot cars to all the cars that I want them to spot that session. And that's where you can control the amount of work that that switch engine has by choosing which cars you spot and how many cars you spot. So I go through and I put all the spot cars and uh, ta spot tags on all the waybills that I want them uh, spotted. Now, the $64,000 question that everybody asks at this time is, how long does this take? This sounds like this takes forever. It's not as bad as it sounds. After my last op session, I timed how long it took me to restage. Uh, I had a total of 223 cars on the layout. Uh, I pulled all the way bills from staging. That was a total of 73 cars, took four minutes. I turned the way bills and pulled and adjusted the way bills at industry. That took 28 minutes. And that was, I had 71 cars at industry and I touched 59 of those cars. Then I filed the way bills, eight minutes. I selected 42 new way bills, that took 17 minutes. And then I went back and I applied the way bills to all the cars in uh, the staging and industry, that took 36 minutes. And finally, five minutes to do 35 cars worth of spot tags. Total an hour and 38 minutes. Now, the caveat with that is that um, of the 223 cars on my layout, uh, because I model so much of the, of the industries that I do, there's, there's steel and that type of industry, uh, 100 of, the, of those 223 cars are open top cars. So every time I change a way bill or put in a, a new way bill or change from a load to an empty, I have to do something to the load in the open top cars. So in steps two and steps five, um, there were about 65 cars total between those two steps that I had to uh, change out loads, swap out a load, do something different with the load on an open top car. And that's included in that time. So we've gone through, we've swapped out all the loads, we've rebuilt everything. Time to run trains and have fun. So. Anybody have any questions? All right, Dave, thanks so much for presenting. I do have some, there are a few questions. We'll just walk through. All right. Uh, first question, how do you determine when to use the overhead moves for balance? Also, do you balance the cars destined for specific industries? The cars, uh, the overhead I use, um, a lot of that is depending on how many cars I want at the various interchanges. Uh, I want to have a certain number of cars that I'm going to, to build out of an interchange for the next session. So I wanna make sure in order to have the cars in the interchange, I have to build them to the interchange. So a lot of times I will make sure that I build some overhead cars there plus for example, the, the reefer that I sent to the B&O. On my layout, I have very few industries that are in the food products. And that's actually prototypical. The Wilmington and Northern didn't handle a lot of food products. So a lot of those reefers uh, are basically just overhead moves. And um, the... Um, as far as balancing the specific industries, I do that when I select the waybills. 
I will decide how many waybills I want to pull for each industry. And so I want to, uh, for example, at uh, Coatesville, I've got two steel mills. One is slightly or rolling mills. I've got one that's slightly larger than the other. So at Worth, I'll send maybe two cars of coal there and maybe three cars of coal to uh, Lucan's and then one car of coal to uh, Viaduct Steel. And I just balance, do the balancing there um, in that step. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's how it works. All right, uh, next question. When did car tickets go out and waybills come into use? I, uh, car tickets in the early 1900s, I'm, I don't know specifically when they come up, came up with the standard waybill form, but I think it was a lot of rules changed, a lot of the, a whole, a whole bunch of things changed somewhere around 1910. In the 19, you know, pre-World War I, in that pre-World War I era, a lot of things changed. And I think that's where they standardized the waybills. And so the standard uh, waybill form came about in that era. And from then on, everybody used the same form. Okay. Uh, Mark Rickert mentions, I have some empty car cards filled out in the late 60s on the IC. Uh, okay. Uh, how do you determine how often an industry needs a card, loaded or empty, delivered to it to avoid sending more cars than, than the industry can hold? Uh, that a lot of that is, uh, like I said, in the when I go around and turn all the waybills, I obviously see how many cars I have at each industry, and by knowing um, how many cars I'm going to when I turn the waybills, I know how many cars I'm going to pull out of the the industries, and so that gives me a rough idea of how many cars I can put into the industries. Now, obviously this becomes a lot harder if you have a layout that has 800 cars on it and 3000 industries and you're gonna forget. But uh, for, you know, I've got a 200 and it'll, it'll be somewhere up around 250 at some point car layout. And so I can have a fairly decent idea of how many cars to do plus that sheet that I had that said how many cars I wanna put on each job, that throttles how much I am gonna pump in there. And if I, if I overrun an industry and I have an off spot, I have an off spot, that happens. But this keeps it from getting wildly out of control. Okay. And then a follow-up, second question, how are you using the binding spines to hold the car car? Uh, yeah, that's something I actually found on, on, saw a picture of online and I really like it. Uh, they are uh, uh, binder spines. You can, they're one inch diameter binder spines. You can get them um, uh, through Office Depot and that. You may have to special order them. Sometimes they have them in stock. Is that, uh, that, that plastic, I, that plastic? That plastic oh. backing that's it's just a, it's got a whole bunch of little fingers. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think they call them uh, combs sometimes as well. Yeah, the binder combs, that's it, yes. Uh, and don't have any right here, here. I was gonna look and see. Uh, but anyway, they're used for binding like uh, like uh, paperback books and reports and that. And so what I do is I screw them with uh, two or three uh, pan head screws into the fascia. And the nice thing I like about them is that you can, they have a spring action that holds the card in there. so a breeze or somebody walking by isn't going to scatter them. And the other thing is that if you bump into it, it's soft. Got it. Um, what are some of the advantages of waybills over systems like switch lists? <laughs> uh, that, uh, well, that gets into a religious a, debate. <laughs> that's a six hour, that's a six hour discussion. Yeah. And, but anyway, what the reason if I had enough space and enough time on the operating session, the probably the most prototypical system you can have is car cards and waybills with handwritten lists. 
because that's how railroads operated for about 125 years. And so that is, you know, if, if you had to pick a prototype way to do it, that would be it. Um, the nice thing about the car cards and waybills is you don't have to spend the time writing the lists. So a lot of people don't like, like that. I have switch lists if people want to write up a switch list and do that, and some people do. Uh, but most people just use the car cards and waybills. Um, I have found that commercial switch list systems um, are excellent for developing a switch list for an industry job, but they are not, let's just phrase it this way, they're not optimized for a classification yard. And I say that based on uh, you know, 30 some years experience using prototype yard computer systems, switch list systems. So they are really good for a industry job that's gonna be working industries. They are not quite as the same as the uh, prototype for uh, any kind of a yard type operation. The primary thing that, that no, there was only one system that did this, uh, that was ProTrack, and um, but no other model system has the concept of standing order, of what order the cars are actually sitting in the track. And that's kind of a key thing with a prototype system. It's hugely, hugely labor intensive to maintain, but that's how, that's what the, the how the real railroads won. This is no slam on any of the, the the, uh, the operating systems out there. If you ask me what, I wanna use a switch list, what should I do? I'm gonna tell you use JMRI, it's great for that. JMRI is the only switch list system that I was able uh, to set up on my railroad and get it to generate any kind of a, a usable switch list, um, you know, with just a couple hours work in it. Well, more than a couple hours, but several hours of work setting it up. Yeah. So it's, it's a wonderful system. And um, if you like switch list, computer generated switch list, JMRI, it's free, go for it. Well, but, and it's also, it's also well supported, right? There's it's well supported, of it's got lots it, of people using it. You can find lots of layouts to go, you know, go try yes. it out first before you go yes. committing. Yeah, it's, it's like I say, if, if, that, if you wanna use a computerized switch list, that's a great one to, to, to try. On the other hand, I, don't, I, I prefer the car cards and waybills. From my standpoint, the way I operate it, I think that I have a, a more, the decisions that the crews have to make are closer to what the, the prototype use. The paperwork doesn't match. I fully acknowledge that the prototype crews use switch lists. Preference. Got it. All right, uh, Burr's question, how do you feel about the option to put a when empty return to blank field in the car itself, or the car card itself rather than inserting a wave at all? And that's certainly something that I, that I could, uh, could do. Uh, and actually, actually my car cards uh, do have a, um, an empty, empty return. I don't know if you can see this there, it's backwards, that's wonderful. Um, but uh, it, I do have that on there. The only thing is it's just generic. And so I like to put the empty returns, uh, have, be able to have the ability to put on a specific empty return um, that will drive it to where I want it to, to go. Like I say, there are times that I want something to be held uh, or go to Coatesville, there may be times I want to just run it back to Reading because Coatesville's got too many empty guns there uh, yep. at the time. Okay. Not today, but it does happen. All right. Uh, do you have any cars in captive service? Um, not specifically. Uh, where they go, they uh, ping pong back from the same industries to that. I do have some cars that are something like that because I have certain guns that are des designated for stone loading. And so there's a quarry and they'll go just to that quarry. And then at some point when I complete the French Creek branch, um, 
I will have some iron ore uh, hoppers that will go just between the iron ore mine at um, uh, St. Peter's and the uh, uh, iron furnace at uh, Birdsboro. And so they'll ping pong back and forth. Okay. All right. And then it looks like the last question for prototype blocking. Oops, Does the prototype train manifest for cars in a block show the final destination or only the next destination? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, depending on what you're looking at, it can show um, the uh, it can show the it, the final destination, and it will definitely show the next destination. It'll usually have on a prototype list will basically have both. Um, you can even get if you do certain lists, it will show you what the block is now and it will show you what the block will be at the next location. And the next location uses that to figure out what they've got coming into them and where it's gonna go. So, but on a train consist, it'll usually show where the car is going and it'll show what block it's, it's in, which tells you where it's, it's going. Now, on a, this is with a computerized list, with a, hand, a handwritten list, it'll be much simpler. Um, and, but with the computerized list, it's also a very, 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 very coded. So instead of saying it's going to go to Houston, Texas on the UP, or if it was in North Platte, it's gonna say uh, uh, NX 284E would be what it would say. It would have a, a column and every car would say NX 284E. And as soon as I saw NX 284E, I'd say, oh, that's North Platte. B372 is Houston. C625 is Alexandria, Louisiana. So it would say all these things and then off to the end, it would have some sort of a, uh, uh, they call it a 333, which is the first three letters, the middle three letters and the last three letters of the station name. It would have the 333 for where its, its final destination is. You, you need a secret decoder ring to read a prototype document. <laughs> All right, and then a follow-up to that question. Uh, if, the, if only the next destination is shown, how does the receiving yard know the next destination for a car? Because uh, of the way build. And what the, now, uh, and also a lot of this, it, it depends, the way bill is the, is the memory. That's why you have the way bill that follows the car. That's why the uh, car ticket, the rules of the 1903 PNR rules say that the car ticket has to go with the car is because you have, they use that way bill and the information, there's about 200 fields on a, on a way bill, on a prototype way bill. And they use something in the combination of those 200 fields to figure out where it is. Now, if you're talking computerized, there's tables with all sorts of different things. And this could go way off into the weeds for trying yeah. describing how this does, but they, they use different things uh, um, that the, the railroad has set up that if it's this type of car from with this type of commodity and it's going to this station through this junction, it's in this block. And so it'll do all that dynamically. And so, um, you know, the, it's magic. The yard masters look at the track and it's showing all the next blocks. As a matter of fact, um, for example, when I was on the, um, uh, on the UP, on the, uh, um, the region, I, I worked on a lot of the regions that border the Mississippi River. And so we could see cars that were built on Conrail in Pennsylvania, where Conrail's computer would send some preliminary waybill information to us and an ETA, and then our computer would take it and figure out where it was going to go. So I could see a car that was in in Pittsburgh could kind of tell where it was going to be going on our railroad while it was still in Pittsburgh. We hadn't even touched the car yet, and we could see the advanced billing. Now, this would be a train, I could look at a train, 
you know, this would be a train five days from now, but I could see what it was, what was going on. Okay. Computers are magic. They're wonderful. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that. There are days. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, again, you can also bring an entire railroad to its knees with a computer. So it's oh yeah. Well, I would doing... imagine you can. I would imagine you can. You can bring it to its knees without a computer too. But uh, yeah. computers make it a lot faster. So. Yes. Anyway, Dave, again, thanks for thanks so much for presenting. Hopefully, like, there's lots of uh, positive comments out in the chat.